so it wasn't secret and secure with the city. But now I just got a letter on that. Yeah, very good. Right. Yeah. conversation Is it fun? Oh. Hey, dude. Hey, sir. You like my new look? Yeah. <laughs> See the other guy. You weren't kidding about a packet. So he's trying to put Norpac back in business, huh? There's the paper company. Phone number six oh seven. So that's fine. We begin right we have a quorum. So with that. <clears throat> ben, why don't you go through the online participation guidelines? Sure thing. Um, we ask everyone to get the chair's attention before uh, speaking, put, putting your name on the record. Uh, Jeff is our chair. For those that are online using Zoom, you can use the raise hand function at the bottom of the screen. Uh, for those who are online, just like that. Um, for those that are online on the phone, you can hit star six to mute or unmute. Uh, and star nine is what raises your hand. Um, and we will make sure to get to everyone. Thanks. And if you're trying to get my attention, you don't need to throw anything. <laughs> um, unless it's absolutely necessary. We then keep it soft. Um, okay, we hear you have a public comment period for items that are not on our agenda tonight. Do you have any public comment? Um, <clears throat> my name is Lonnie Gates, and I live at Rock Creek Assisted Living. And in my backyard, I'm real familiar with the mm -hmm. property. And um, I've been there three years, and I look forward to the development. I think it'd be a great thing for the city. No negative for me. It's all positive. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, and then we have a, a hand up online. Okay. Christy, you can mute, unmute yourself. And go ahead. If you're speaking, we can't hear you on this side. Uh, if you can hear us, can you raise your hand one more time? Okay. Works going out, but not coming in. We need people to run families with that. 
people out here to talk. Everything's showing the same. Um, Christy, if you'd like to try to call in, uh, the number is on the packet uh, that's posted on the city website. Uh, 253-215-8782. And then the meeting ID is 856-3738. Eight one one two. Is Johanna able to speak? Johanna, can you um, feed back to us if everything's working on your side? Okay, thank you. The hand works, Christy, the microphone doesn't. Maybe we'll monitor, and there's our hands. Um, okay, to the caller, you can try to uh, unmute, pressing star six. Hello? Hello. Hi, guys, sorry to bother you, but online, I'm getting no audio. Yet I can hear when the Zoom voice comes on. But you're saying Joanna is able to hear it online? I believe she responded to us uh, by raising her hand. Yep. I, I'm only able to hear on the phone, but I wanted you to know that we can't hear online. And the phone, it doesn't hear very well. It's not picking up Jeff, and I can hear you. But the audio is not working online. Okay. Apologize for that. I don't know what the next um, solution is. Mm -hmm. All right, well, I'll continue on the phone, but if they could speak up, I don't know how many microphones you have, but it's pretty hard to hear. I can hear you well. You must be close. <laughs> Closer, <laughs> yep. We'll all work harder, Christy. All right, thank you. How do I uh, mute myself? I can take care of that. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Okay, <clears throat> so with that, we can move on to the approval of our minutes for the September 11th meeting. And I read through them and I motion to approve the minutes of September 11, 2023. A motion to approve the minutes. Do we have a second? I'll second that. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 So same sign. Minutes are approved. Thank you. Okay, Ben, I think we're ready to uh, take off our, <clears throat> our new business. Okay. Uh, you have in front of you a shoreline substantial development permit request for a site that is on uh, Rock Cove, adjacent to Rock Creek Drive, uh, close to the intersection of Rock Creek Drive and Foster Creek. Uh, whenever the Planning Commission is acting on a permit, we need to, um, by Washington State statute, establish that you are fair and impartial uh, for the community uh, and, and for the applicants in order to act on this. Uh, we ask you a slate of three questions uh, to establish your fairness and impartiality. One is if you've had any ex parte communications, any communications outside of these chambers or with staff about the uh, project. Uh, if you have, we ask you to divulge the content of those discussions um, uh, for the rest and um, for the, the public at large to determine your ability to be fair. The second is whether you have any financial stake in the outcome of this, um, either benefiting or that might hinder you. 
the third is if there's anything else about the proposal that would impact your ability to be fair and impartial and uh, your duties here. So with those three questions, I'll just put it all to you to um, disclose any appearance of fairness issues you might have. I have no ex parte. I have no ex parte. Nor do I. Okay. Any uh, financial stake in the outcome of the decision tonight? That's no. a negative. Okay. Uh, anything else about the project, its location, uh, applicants, anything no. at all that would cause you to be? I drove by there today. It looks like it's going to be interesting. I will say that I did participate in the earlier shoreline permit hearing. So I'm somewhat familiar with the property in the earlier proposal and uh, I'm up to speed on the new one. So, okay. Uh, we have a no disclosures on the first two questions, but um, an indication that we're familiar with the property and past proposals there. Uh, for the applicants, do you see any reason to challenge the Planning Commission's ability to act fairly and virtually? Okay. And then same question to any public that's present, if there's a challenge to the Planning Commission's ability to be fair and impartial. I don't see any. I think you are clear on that one. So we're ready for your staff report then? Ready for my staff report. Um, I will keep it brief, but I do imagine going into a lot of detail um, when we get into um, more of the discussion. So uh, this is our first shoreline substantial development permit that has come through under the new uh, SMP. And with the new SMP, there are more upfront requirements on applicants to, to get uh, narratives and justifications in place to make the permitting process easier. Uh, for you. These applicants have uh, had gone through many of those and provided justifications and uh, things were looking good uh, in staff's eye. We did get public comments from the Department of Ecology and the Department of Fish and Wildlife last week, um, it, Friday the week before, Monday of last week and Friday of last week too, uh, that um, raised some concerns about the analyses and justifications that went into the project. So um instead of having a draft uh shoreline substantial de permit, development permit that's ready to go and that i could recommend issuing to you i have a little bit less than that um asking the uh applicants to provide some more justification to respond to uh fish and wildlife and ecology's uh concerns there uh, by and large though this uh project fits in well with your shoreline management uh program uh, it's a water enjoyment, commercial use of uh, the active waterfront shoreline SED. So that's your most active, most dense developments, um, uh, intense use uh, shoreline zone. Uh, the proposal is for overnight lodging and then um, a, well, I believe there are 13 units, uh, overnight lodging units. And 19, I believe. 19. 19. There's some inside uh, a larger <laughs> activity center. So I think that it's uh, written in here, envisioning that weddings would um, go here and be sort of an all-inclusive area where people could stay and gather for the ceremony and the, the party after. So uh, that's what the proposal is. Um, the two items um, that I had for you to, to really discuss. Um, one was on cultural resources. So cultural resources report was put together for the 2020 permit. Uh, and that document uh, was carried forth into the record for this. It recommended um, an inadvertent discovery plan saying if you uh, dig up anything that's um, or that it's gone, you have to stop all work <laughs> and contact all the appropriate jurisdictions. Uh, city got comments from um, agencies in advance or as part of that permitting process, and the agencies recommended a monitoring plan and on-site monitor to be there to tell you to stop working and to call the appropriate agencies. City Council disregarded that uh, request the last time around. Um, so it's not built into this project. It's a question for you. Um, well, 
uh, one step more. Based on the new SMP, it should be included in this project. So I bring it up as a question for you to, to ensure that you want to um, differ from what the city council did the last time around. The second issue that I have for you guys to focus in on is the public access plan. And I've got some figures to dive into that and really get into the public access. But one of the findings that you need to make is that the current proposal doesn't negatively impact existing public access. And there's one spot um, where this would connect into uh, an offsite easement that I think it's hard for you to make that uh, finding that there's no negative impact on the, the existing public access. So looking closely at that, again, the um, applicants will provide some additional testimony on, on all these things. Uh, the, the other two issues that come from the public comments, fish and wildlife, are related to each other. Um, the first is about establishing um, the appropriate mitigation sequence. And a mitigation sequence is a thought process that you go through when you uh, lay out a site. And it says, first, we want you to avoid all impacts to critical habitat areas in this case. Avoid all impacts. If you get to the point where you can't avoid impacts, then you minimize. And then if you get to the point where you can't minimize any more of those, then you start looking into rectifying the impact that you have, reducing it over time, compensating for it. And there's a challenge uh, to the site plan saying that they haven't, that it, they're capable of avoiding an impact and they haven't avoided impacts. And so I believe that they're um, here to respond to that as well. Um, uh, Department of Ecology made that comment. I don't believe that Fish and Wildlife did in there. Um, and then it comes to the second issue, which is one to that we'll need to talk about, I think, a little bit more too, is that our critical areas ordinance acknowledges when sites are really degraded, and it says that, look, the world's not going to be perfect, but we want to stop further degrading the site. With this one, it's very degraded in the sense that it has riprap armoring around much of it from its days um, in operation as a mill. That's all okay per our codes, but um, in that case, you need to restore what's still on site. And once you're, uh, I'm sorry, enhance what's on site, because these are different terms. Once you've enhanced that, then you can't um, do additional on site mitigation, you search for off site mitigation options. We, we don't have that as part of the current proposal, and I wasn't given that guidance uh, to the applicants to bring it to the table as part of this proposal. So that's something new that we need to explore and get um, some indication about how to move forward into the record on that. Largely four things that I think you need to talk about. There are, I believe, six topics um, that I counted overall in, in the comments. Some of them I just don't think are, are very germane to, to what you're what you're looking at, we can go in depth on those um, more. Um, but Fish and Wildlife makes several references to um, more recent studies than our last set of regulatory update, um, including their own efforts and uh, using site potential tree height to establish buffers. What that means is you look at the um, the site's potential to grow a tree and the tallest tree that that site could grow is uh, where the buffer should be because if a tree were to fall in that area then it took into a nurse tree and 40 degree into the water uh, that's not part of our regulations currently um, there's also discussion of uh, stormwater uh, impacts there's a stormwater management plan in here uh, that's been prepared in accordance with the regulations that we require. So I don't think that you need to spend a lot of time on any of those. There is um, something in there that you might uh, take a look at. And it's talking about incorporating uh, best management practices into the shoreline public access plan. Uh, as an example, they say, making sure there's adequate um, trash cans along. So I don't know if that's something that you would want to dive into detail in and condition at the city level to require trash cans or if that's something that um, the applicants will 
more naturally do as uh, the need manifests. There's no adverse effects to Foster Creek, is there? Uh, nothing that's been presented for the record, nothing that I can imagine. Yeah. So my question is, where is the public access question? So in the colored maps toward the back of the documents, um, I give a series and I have, I have, I'll have that on the screen to be able to refer to also. Um, but I, I can do that now. This is the proposal um, that they brought forth. I think they have uh, a slightly modified one mm -hmm. um, to, to show us as part of their presentation too. Uh, the proposal that they have um, comes in off of Rock Creek Drive here. Uh, these are the water areas around the site. Comes in off of Rock Creek Drive, functions much as a sidewalk, internal circulation, and then goes um, behind some cabins up to the north. Uh, comes around waterward on this side. Uh, is back. It also includes um, an additional loop out um, by these. There are other sidewalks that are included in here that they show as the public would have the ability to use these too. This is what I identified as. So Florida is included in the. Florida is included. Okay. Um, this is where it comes. There's an off site easement that comes in that's not addressed by this. Okay. Uh, this is the proposal today, giving an indication of where. Where we've come from, um, the county divided this property in uh, the 90s, I believe. They established the orange easement that goes around the outside of uh, the property. That was um, lines on a map. There, okay. there wasn't really truth to say what it would take to build any sort of pathway there, but the easement was established, nothing was developed. Uh, in 2020, as part of the permitting process, the applicants proposed um this so uh some a small loop on the inside for internal circulation uh a lollipop around i believe it was a fire pit there and a viewing area over the cove uh that proposal was reviewed by staff it was reviewed by the planning commission it was reviewed by city council and several additional public access uh, points were added to that so it became all of this okay um and that is all of those are established easement areas today. Uh, the uh, again, this is back to the proposal. So, where this um, Florida path used the same easement that was there in the past, it was never constructible. It wasn't constructible in 2020 when uh, city council required it, but it carried through. They put together a constructible path on Florida. Okay this um, internal loop is much larger than it was. Um, it's lacking what was a planning commission recommendation in the city uh, council requirement to connect from here over to Rock Creek Drive. And it's, it's lacking this connection here. That's the one that I think you guys will have the hardest time uh, just justifying that there's no uh, reduction in public access or negative impact on public access. Um, the shoreline access plan, which was adopted after this application was submitted, um, and after 2020, so they, the consultants here threw in all those, uh, public access lines from, uh, the plat from the 2020 decision, even they said, okay, that's probably a little bit overkill having, having a larger, um, in these areas, this area would be waterward of those cabins and then having this uh, connection in there is part of our plan. It's not regulatory in the sense of applying it to these guys because it came in after their proposal came in. Um, but it's an asset that we can look to. Uh, and um, there's all the detail that yes. they went into to that drawing. So, you know, again, this is a good example of how concept hits reality. Um, when you guys talked about it, everything there is that here's the concept and, and uh, work more toward it um, in the engineering sense. But 
Ben, are we allowed to ask a question? And that if you go up uh, to where you have the purple line, I'm sorry, the yeah, mm -hmm. right there, is that path? I just show it uh, on the assisted living center. I just show that as a dirt trail. There's not really a path there. It's, yeah, uh, it's, it's easement it right now. Go the way. Okay, easements. If it's even, yeah. If there's any grading that happened there, I would be shocked. Yeah, and my concern with where number seven is, we have a really steep grade on both of those sides to come in. We'd almost have to bridge that. Mm -hmm. It's uh, and so we wanted to come back out to the sidewalk and avoid that number seven only because of the way it, it's in a critical area, steep slope, and you'd have to bridge it to get across it. So that was that was my only big concern out of the whole thing. And then the only other place as you were talking, uh, as you got to the point there, the only other beach access is right there. Everything else is too steep when you walk this. It's a anywhere from a three foot to a five foot drop off. And uh, right there, on the point, uh, no, here it comes down right here. You can get in. There's a little bit of a beach here, and that's where people can come. Okay. So you're trying to make it where they you come in there, and then either go this way or that way, or straight out. If they brought their vehicles in, we thought they're probably not going to walk with boards and stuff. They're going to park in our parking, and so we want to make it the easiest access where we can come in and handle that point because there's no other. Beach or access if you walk that everything else is a steep drop. Oh, that's the old boat launch. Is that what it is? Yeah, it's yeah. you can get to it, you know, and it actually has a little dirt road to it. Right. Yeah. So that was our thought on some of these areas that were critical and steep that we were trying to stay away from the edges as much as we could. Uh, but still give them beach access or public access. Thank you. Yes, Johanna. Just a name, please. Oh, who spoke? Uh, I'm Dean Maldonado, the developer. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, sorry. All right, thank you. Let me double sharing the screen next time. Um, I'll do that right now. <laughs> so is there going to be a decision tonight? There could be, Mary. Yeah. This is a lot of data. Mm -hmm. Been reading for hours. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. There you go. Hmm. Y'all ready for me? Joanna's hand still up. Joanna, if your hand is um, still up, you can go ahead and participate at any time. Uh, I can lower it. Yeah. All right. Go ahead. Welcome. Thank you. Hello. Uh, my name is Brad Kilby. I'm a, a senior planner and planning manager for Harper Rock Peterson Regillas. Uh, we're a small multidisciplinary firm um, uh, working out of uh, Portland, Vancouver. Bend and Salem, um, and uh, I'm here tonight representing the Rock Cove hospitality development. I think uh, before I kick off on the technical issues, I thought it would be good to have Mr. Maldonado uh, give you a little bit of background on his experience thus far with trying to develop this property and the number of um, layouts he's <laughs> actually looked at for developing the property, if that's okay. Mm -hmm. Hi, thank you. I'm Dean Maldonado. Um, I think we've been going out this about three years now, haven't we been? Um, we were aided by COVID and all the crazy stuff that went on there that really shut us down uh, for a year. The other problem uh, that we uh, possess here in Washington is we have seasons. It starts November, December. We stay out of the gorge and you know, we stay out of the mud and clay and stuff. So it really shortens up our year 
So that's extended this out over uh, the period of time. Unfortunately, during that process has been in, has been very accommodating to help us understand a lot of stuff here. Is, uh, items change with cities, departments, wildlife different. So it seems like our goal keeps moving in front of us. First, we have this and then this and then we get some last minute letters here. And so we've kind of gotten to the point now where we're chasing this this thing. And I'd like to get to the point where we can at least go, hey, here's the things you know, that we need to get done. Let us uh, go after these with it. and hopefully it doesn't continue to move like it has due to COVID or due to changes or due to the three years and everybody else implementing stuff. Um, and you're not alone here. We have other projects in other cities that we're, we're you know, getting to the same thing. So the main thing is um, we put about a million and a half dollars into this project. We'd like to see it come out of the ground. I think it's something that uh, if you look at our other projects around from we built police station, grocery store stuff. Uh, we do it right. You know, we do it safe. We do it environmentally clean. Uh, but we're really struggling in here the last two or three years. So we've probably been through five uh, changes in the layouts here and the requirements and stuff. And, and I'm not, you know, throwing this monkey on your back. It's been both ways. We've had issues with uh, building, trying to get materials in, trying to get uh, subcontractors, you know, uh, engineers, environmentals and stuff get done. So we're really struggling to get this thing out of the ground due, unfortunately, to COVID and, and life. So um, I've had five or six changes. I'd really like to get to something where we can go, hey, this is what we want you to build, Dean, you know, and that's what we'd like to get done. We'd really like to then go after that and said, okay, you know, we can do this or, hey, we're having problems with this one issue or this. But I'd like to get it shored up if I can and get to moving forward so we can get this thing out of the ground in the spring. We're getting late this time of year. I'm going to lose another season. Um, when we get said and done, this will end up around six and a half to $7 million project. It's going to be a good project. It'll bring some tax money in, you know, for it and enhance the community. And uh, I think that's kind of where you want to be. So we're all in, want to get moving forward, but we'd really like to get a, a the final measuring stick, we don't want it to keep moving. I kind of like to get to the point where this, this is what's required of us. And it's, I'm not pointing fingers, I'm just saying we're there, you know, so I'd like to get this done. Thanks, Dean. Thank you. Again, Brad Kilby. So some of you already know this, obviously, the project location is in Rock Cove, Rock Cove um, which is a probably uh, fed by the Columbia River under the bridges. But it's not actually part of, I mean, it's not the Columbia River. However, um, it's afforded the same protection uh, on a shoreline as the Columbia River is uh, under your shoreline management program. Uh, it's 6.4 acres and it is um, uh, zoned commercial recreation and it allows for water dependent uses and water enjoyment uses. This is from the uh, the Columbia Gorge Interpretive Center and Museum. This actually showed how impacted this site has been in the past. So as you know, it was in operation from 1952 to 1973, uh, the Hedgewall Veneer Mill. And it, um, I, I guess a key point you'll see if you read Ecology's letters, they complain about the amount of riprap that's on the site. So about 70% of the site is riprap. Uh, probably put there by the mill. And I should just note that that predated the Shoreline Management Act. That actually didn't come into play until 1971, was passed by the legislature, and then ultimately by the citizenship in 73. Um, so it wasn't uh, Mr. Maldonado going out there to put um, riprap into the, into the site. <clears throat> um, up until I would say, 10 years ago, riprap was an acceptable way to control erosion on the rivers. It tends to be uh, waning now. Um, there's some information in the Department of Fish and Wildlife's um, comments about uh, the floodplain and that they were concerned about property being developed within the floodplain. So this is actually on zone C, which is identified by FEMA, but it's an area subject to minimal flooding, if at all. And then zone A are the areas that are actually protected uh, through flood floodplain management um, requirements in most jurisdictions. 
Um, and then uh, it's important to note that the Columbia River is a dammed facility, so they can do a lot to control floods by opening and closing those dams as well. So it's actually not in the flood. Um, I want to bring this up because this came up, this comes up in the conversation from both ecology and Department of Fish and Wildlife. So this is the um, mitigation sequencing. So uh, I don't want to read this. You've all seen this probably in writing your code, but avoiding the impact altogether is by not taking any action or um, not having much of an action. The, the protected resources on this site are obviously the shoreline and then the habitat conservation area, which I'll go into in a minute. Um, I'm, it's important to note that he said five or six, but we counted 21 different site plans that were looked at over the last three years on this site. Uh, and I will say that not all of them avoided and neither does this one avoid uh, impacts to that habitat conservation area, which I'll speak to in a moment. But I do think that we're willing to take steps to actually avoid those impacts um, with, with some caution. I mean, there, there's some areas that we'll, I'll point out that you might want to uh, allow um, impacts to. The next one is to minimize those impacts. Um, and so what we're going to propose tonight is maybe pulling back some of the units, and I'll talk about that in a moment, out of that habitat conservation area. Um, but it also, uh, there was a comment from the Department of Ecology about not allowing trails within that habitat conservation area as well. And so you'll see that habitat conservation area. It's in ELS's report, but I'm, I'm going to show it to you in a moment. And so there are other things that we're willing, and we've talked uh, with Dean about, to make sure that we balance the interest and the competing interest between reg regulatory agencies, the community, and then uh, ultimately the developer's interests. Um, rectifying the impact, reducing it over time. I feel like that's probably one of the reasons that you enhance or mitigate is to rectify impacts and you're reducing those over time, hopefully those areas. And you'll see those areas actually have um, rebounded the areas that they're calling the habitat conservation areas are areas that have uh, rebounded since you saw mm -hmm. when the mill was on the site and closed down. Uh, and then compensate for impact by replacing, enhancing, or providing substitute re resources or environment, and um, then the monitoring for the impact. So those were all covered in the uh, Ecological Land Services uh, Habitat Report. There was a, um, I, I was talking to Ben about this earlier, and I think it's probably germane to your conversation. In here, there was about $23,000 of mitigation. Um, there's a table in here on costs on page 18 of that report that outlines the uh, monitoring and mitigation. And then based on uh, the comment that we received from ecology and then in, in talking with Ben, we can't really um, mitigate on this site then. But we will be mitigating, we will be enhancing some of this. So some of this cost associated, the, or the, all of the costs that they've got in here would be associating with the enhancement and now we would need to get direction from you on um, what you would think would be just compensation for mitigation offsite. And I understand that you guys do have some projects that are in your pipeline for uh, the ability to mitigate, but they're not at a point where they have been funded or cost evaluated. So um, we just wanna, that's one of the concessions that I think we would have to make is if we're not mitigating on site, is to come up with uh, something at that point that would help to um, maybe um, mitigate some impacts that you might try be trying to do through your capital facility plans. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to talk about that. I do believe that we did go through this despite what Department of Ecology says. Um, the, they didn't have the benefit of looking at 21 different site plans. We looked at the uh, most pressing and then um, there were some alternatives that you've probably already seen, and this is just showing just a couple of the alternatives that have already been produced for this site. Um, this had row homes. Um, I think this was an earlier rendition of what was previously approved. Um, and then this is a second alternative where it's all the row cabins and no event space. And then this is the previously approved site plan that had the phase two event space 
And then was it still 19 cabins here? No, we had uh, two, three, four, we had 16. 17, and then we 19, had, 20, 21. Yeah, a little more. Okay. So I'm just saying that there, there's been several iterations of this plan considered. Mm -hmm. This is a key uh, indicator right here. So this is what is referenced in the ELS report. And it was actually, uh, I would, uh, in, in Oregon, we say uh, when we go to division of state land, they concur with the delineation uh, for wetlands and things. And actually Department of Ecology was involved with ELS at the point that they had gone out and concurred on the location of these uh, habitat areas. Um, so the design goals, I guess, moving forward from us was to increase public access to Rock Cove and that we heard that in the last sets of hearings that we had with both you and the council, protect the existing fish and wildlife conservation areas located around the shoreline. There are two of them and they're fairly large um, and then prevent uh, provide an event space be utilized by local and regional tourists. Um, so that goes back to uh, shoreline enjoyment type uses. And then I wanted to talk about this because we, we did give a lot of thought to this uh, location of bringing this across. And I'll say that um, Bruce Honrider here is with me. He's one of our civil engineers and one of the principals out of our Vancouver office. We stopped on our way out here to take a look at this and I'll let him weigh in on uh, the feasibility of actually making a connection across here. So in our plan, let's see that. In our plan, we're actually proposing to take it out to uh, the roadway as opposed to bringing it across and connecting to the existing path out on the highway. We went over here to the other side of the assisted living facility, looked at that. They have it gated off or fenced behind their facility. And it may very well be something that you would do in the future. Definitely not going to be an accessible path um, from an ADA perspective. Uh, these are very uh, steep ravines and then it's it's steepest, mm -hmm. I think, um, back here along the street. So you can just go out there and look at that. So we're not proposing to extinguish the easement. If there was a need that the city and they came up with the money to ultimately build this, we think it would have to be a bridge. There's certainly um, that easement would remain. We're not proposing to extinguish any easements. Yeah. And then this is the proposed design. So we actually brought it uh, <coughs> to the street or out to the street to connect here. Um, and then all the blue lines are the areas that we're proposing to provide um, public access. Um, so that's even different than this map that we saw. Yes. Okay. Um, and I'll go through some of the comments from, I think it's uh, Department of Fish and Wildlife in a moment. So here's the pink line. This is the pink uh, line on the south end, which I think is probably uh, one of the cruxes of uh, Department of Ecology's comments. Like they are like, no, you, you shouldn't be impacting this at all. Um, so we looked at this and looked about pushing units up out of that to minimize those impacts. Um, and then, so these units, will, and this one might have to go away. So we would have to reduce by unit just to make sure that we could put all these in. Let's see, this is the public access real quick. If you want to so, talk about that. And yep. Thanks for it. Bruce Honrider, uh, civil engineer with Harper Hoff, Peter Regellis. And what you're looking at is just kind of a blown up area of where that access path would be that was in purple. And it's probably a little hard to see for those online, but each of those numbered lines is five feet in elevation. And as you can see where that easement would cross, it drops down about 20, 25 feet and actually comes up about 35 feet on the other side. So like Brad said, even if we did bridge that, it, it would need switchbacks or something to even have a, any chance of meeting ADA or it would just have to be uh, stairs or something like that. Um, so very challenging spot, which is why we connected to the 10 foot path that would literally be, I think about 20 feet away and then just to maintain that, that through way. Thanks, Bruce. 
Um, I wanted to, I don't know how I can go back. There's room for footsteps. Not in the easement currently, so it probably have to be expanded. Okay. Greater disturbed area too. Here's the other, uh, so this habitat conservation area on this other side, so we can pull these units out. But there was a question, and we had spoke with Ben about this, about, you know, if pedestrian um, access, is the intention is to have it on the back side of these units, it's possible for us to make that connection. We will still end up impacting here unless we move this unit forward, and maybe we'd be able to stay out of that. So um, those those are possibilities if uh, um, planning commissions um, so inclined. And honestly, we don't want to have an appeal from the Department of Ecology. So if these are the uh, issues that they're having with this site plan, then we're willing to massage this to move it out. Um, parking areas are generally, I, I, real quick, I just want to go through the um, Department of Fish and Wildlife. Um, they don't recommend developing within 100 feet of the ordinary high water line to protect gluten removal function. All of our development is um, set to your code. So I think there's a 33 foot buffer for commercial and industrial mixed use developments. Um, so you can go up to 33 feet. And I'm not sure that's, that is shown. Oops. Can't show. I can't see. The dash line. The dash line. Yeah. Um, to minimize impacts of the repairing area with this increased traffic, they're encouraging constructing permeable trails and consolidating the shoreline access. Um, these are recommendations, by the way, they're not codified in Washington administrative code um, or in your own code, but um, I just thought the introduction of six PPD canoe into Rock Creek can be reduced by having effective stormwater management ensuring repairing area buffers are at least 100 foot wide. Um, they just discourage any road surface within 100 feet of the active floodplain channel. So the floodplains out here and any of our vehicular areas are well outside of that 100 foot area. So I don't think that we'd be um, creating any issues there. We, if we move, if we, one thing, if we lose this unit, there's an encroachment. So our total encroachments into that uh, fish and wildlife area is 0.19 acres, and it's a 6.74 acre site. By us moving it out, then our would be very minimal and probably limited to the trail up here and some parking here, but we could reduce the amount of parking because we no longer have this unit. So that's an option. Um, let's see. So while well, fish and wildlife for the review to determine if the rip wrap was legally permitted and installed. Again, I, I believe that that mm -hmm. riprap was installed in the Management Act um, along the mill, which ended in slavery about the same time. Um, Mr. Maldonado did not go out and put any riprap in there. Part of the proposal is to actually enhance this uh, shoreline area. And so that would, in my mind, probably be an improvement as opposed to somebody just walking away from the project and leaving it as is. And um, how would you enhance that shoreline? Just, just planting, example. you're just going to be planted at the top. Perfect. Yeah, you're not yeah. going to be doing the rip wrap. Yeah, we got talked actually doing like things together. Uh, I wanted to make a book out there. And they're like, you talk any of that. We still have to do the stuff. I was like, you know, we can't do this under a lot of books. So, you know, like, you know, like, you walked out there, there's old food, there's still from the old uh, right there where the money was. And we talked about it. And it was like, no, we can't touch it. So, we're more than willing to enhance whatever we can do without turning into a gigantic uh, battle. Well, then, at this point, sorry, at this point, is the riprap not kind of creating a natural habitat? It hadn't that long? first put in what, what did they build that in the 30, 1930? I think so. Yeah. That was 52. 52. I was there. I saw the introductory. 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 I thought we just enhance it. You know, I think once we touch it, then we're going to get trouble. And within the um, packet, you'll see that there are plans for the event center if you wanted to see elevations mm -hmm. and plans. But this has been designed to meet the dimensional requirements of the zone. Um, and then if we make if we move those structures out of that habitat conservation area, then we'll have avoided 
to the extent that we could um, any adverse impacts to that. And then we have an enhanced requirement in anyhow. Currently, our uh, bid to enhance to the landscaping that was done to meet the enhanced requirement is $385,000 of landscape enhancement. So just wanted to touch on the four points that um, Ben brought up, cultural resources. Um, Dean, you're gonna have to speak to this. Typical communities will allow the inadvertent uh, discovery uh, language to be burned to the map or onto the grade plan. It sounds like you guys have had a uh, request to actually have cultural monitoring out, out there during uh, construction activities. Um, I think that's ridiculous. You've had a mill there, you know, uh, they brought in the rip rap. It's uh, what culture do we have there? You built a mill there, you had hydraulics, you had wood burning stuff. What's there that's going to be culture active? Yeah, it's not like Native American yeah. tribe there. You and know. if you did, you covered it up the rap. You know, that's just an actual bird. Become very cumbersome to try and grade out there. And I do believe the inadvertent discovery plan would require if any artifacts are found that they have to stop the site. Um, I don't know if you've been out there, but on the northern part there, uh, there's uh, still, uh, I think it's four foot concrete pads where something's set on. And we already turned that up. We're going to come in and lay the cabin on top of that you know, uh, concrete because we we have to dig you know, six, eight feet down the concrete, four foot of concrete remark. So a lot of that stuff we're not touching the cabin. In. Um, mitigation sequence, uh, I think if, if maybe you can supplement the record with some of the other alternatives that were considered, um, entirely up to you. You'll have this as an exhibit to the record. Um, it's um, here with the city. Offsite mitigation. Um, Dean, do you want to speak to offsite? I mean, so, <laughs> what you're proposing on site can't be counted towards mitigation. It has to be enhancement, and then you have to mitigate offsite. We've done that at other projects too, but you know, we just come do it. Dollar figure, and what are you guys trying to do? Where can we help you to get that done? Welcome to that too. As long as it doesn't turn into a statue of effort. You know, <laughs> One thing I want to add is, as far as just the yes and some of my those are where there's because you know, because the dolls were on sites, I never dig anything, I'm trying to avoid all the lines of them treating this money. We spent half a million dollars putting in the sewer line and apartment. Some of the reason you know we're encroaching a little bit here and there is that was kind of based on the previous plan as well. So that might be a reason we didn't slide some patient as well as here. Mm -hmm. But we want to avoid appeals. If that is true. Yeah. And then as a matter of fact, I just kind of like to see the template, you know, tell me what you mean so we can get done. I don't want to I don't want to stop keep moving and the more time we get, the more mm -hmm. some other organization comes in and says, hey, we want this, we want that, and it affects all of us. And, so. and I just want to talk uh, speaking with the question about the public access. Um, so this was the project last year approved, and there was no public access provided. At that time, not too many to session, probably not going to. But I do think that there's definitely a argument to be made for not making this connection at this point in time without having a plan for how it's going to happen. I've seen small projects where they use rail rail cars mm -hmm. as bridges um, for small streams and things like that. But if you go out there, this is a significantly wider crossing than a rail car could accommodate. So it would have to be an engineered bridge. So um, to actually make the connection from here to here, which again, when you get over here, there is no connection. And I don't know, looking at their building, I feel like it would be um, a very tight sidewalk adjacent to the rear of the building is where they would get access on the backside here to meet that uh, ultimate idea of um, connecting with pedestrians on this side. I'm really against that from the point of maintenance. If you get in a situation where we are with ice and snow and the water and stuff and keeping those things maintained, that's we can't comply with ADA there. We can't comply with a lot of stuff. And that steep slope and critical area, in addition, even if you put bridges now, you've got the steep slope and then you have to enhance it, you know, uh, landscaping wise and maybe more rip out and that ferry gabby. I just see this turning into a, you know, uh, a huge project for the benefit that you would get from it. So the additional sidewalk that you have on the building that might go away. Yeah, right there. Yeah. Is that pretty flat? The yeah. topography yeah. pretty flat? Okay. Yeah. We, can, we can get that idea. You're actually following the grades mm -hmm. because you're walking along. It's a great drop. Yeah. yeah. That's pretty much the top of the, the hill right there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, that concludes my presentation. If you had any questions, I saw Bruce are here, uh, Dean's here. Um, unfortunately, we weren't able to have anybody from ELS here tonight, but if there are questions that you have, I'll definitely write them down and make sure that uh, they're put before them and we can do a response back. Thank you. Thank you for your time. And DLS is the Ecological Land Services, just to clarify that. Yeah, sorry. Then I think this one we can open the public hearing at 7 2.
and um, we look for testimony in favor of this project initially. Really? Yeah. Like we, we'll note that we did have a positive comment during the general public comment uh, in support of this project and the residents of the Blackwood. Are there any others that wanted to speak in favor? How about uh, comments in opposition? Uh, the only negative I can see is this is generally for the for the public. Oh, okay. We'll get we'll Go. get to our conversation in just a minute. Uh, uh, thank you, um, uh, Mary Rapar, Stevenson, and uh, I've heard about this project for a while, and uh, I don't stand in direct opposition to it. I think our questions that need to be answered. This guy is extremely long, and I had a chance to read it in the last hour, uh, and I don't think anybody else has had a chance to read it. So I don't think you can make a, a good decision based on what we have heard up to this because there's questions that need to be asked and challenges from DOE and uh, uh, Fish and Wildlife. I've been writing uh, some things as we've been going along. Uh, I forgot to bring my reading glasses. So here we go. I, you know, I always thought that riprap was illegal, but I know we've used it in the past and before it became a thing that shouldn't be done. And I'm pretty sure that that peninsula would be gone today if the riprap wasn't there. So it probably is going to stay. Uh, it's not pretty and it's dangerous, but that's how you keep the land there. Um, in the packet, as far as I was able to read up to certain pages, um, and these are questions uh, uh, and comments. I don't recall any plaque location, and you all have not discussed that tonight, and that's included in the packet. I, um, uh, the offsite mitigation, I found offsite mitigation to be not all that it's cracked up to be. It's, uh, I don't consider it uh, uh, mitigation. It's just a way to get, uh, give a developer something they want and to get the project done. I've never seen offsite mitigation that actually mitigates for what is being destroyed. And I, I don't approve of it. Um, how many uh, uh, people would the event center hold? Because we're talking about parking. So if you have an event and you're inviting the public and not just the people in the cabins and those who are staying overnight, uh, is there going to be enough parking? And because there is no off street or on street parking in that area uh, at all, except uh, at the little parking uh, lot at the picnic pavilion across on the east side of Rock Cove. So I think we need to know how many, how many, uh, um, how much has, or what is the number of people that will be allowed in the event center? And how much uh, is there enough parking for? for an event center. Um, uh, I, I heard 19 and then I heard 21 cabins. Uh, I presume it's 21 and not the 19 that's mentioned. I think that was the old plan. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's 19 now. Mm -hmm. um, as to the, uh, oh, um, construction buffers, uh, uh, as uh, uh, Mr. Um, Maldonado has, I think that's your name, uh, has pointed out uh, they don't want to do construction during the rainy season, which is a good thing. Uh, but we don't, sometimes the rain comes and we don't know when it's going to come. So will there be construction buffers to keep all that crap from going into rock hole? Uh, and uh, for the cultural survey, the courthouse lawn had to have a cultural survey when they wanted to put the heat pump in there. So is there a cultural survey that's actually in this packet that has already been done by a professional archeologist? And then the follow on question to that is the monitoring. I, I agree, it'd be you know, kind of silly to have somebody there all the time, but um, there are arrowheads around here everywhere. 
and sometimes you just run into one. So um, I think there should be something included that will make cultural monitoring a thing. <laughs> and that should be taken care of uh, in any permitting. Um, I, I would like to know, um, we talked about this public access and I, I've made my uh, uh, views on that well known. I, uh, I consider public access a prerogative of the people and we should have as much public access as possible. And yes, nobody could get access to that peninsula before this development, which thank you very much, you're going to develop it, we'll have more public access. But I think we need to know um, how much was the, what was the length of the original easement and how much easement is the public losing? Uh, this looks good. I, I mean, I, I don't really have any objections to the easement, uh, but, uh, are, are we losing more than we're gaining? I guess is my question. And um, I think, um, oh, um, there was in, and I briefly looked at it and I can't find it again. There's some kind of off-site easement mentioned uh, and that it's not part of this project, but it was included in this packet. Uh, what is that referring to? So those are uh, some of the questions I've had, and I've only uh, read uh, uh, nine pages of this, and I'm sure you know other members of the public may have more. Nobody wants to stop this project, but I think the public deserves to have answers to some of the questions that have been raised. And definitely uh, ecology and fish and wildlife's concerns and challenges need to be addressed thoroughly. Um, yes, we could have projects, but we also have our environment to worry about. And uh, we want to keep our environment uh, to, and conserve it and preserve it as best we can. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Any questions for Mary? Okay, how about comments neither in favor or in opposition to uh, to this proposal? Well, I live above the hill from where this will go, so I drive by it all the time. So I look forward to it actually being developed rather than being what it is right now. Um, <laughs> We're still in the public hearing phase, so let's. No, I'm just saying it's yeah. it's. It's a great idea. I understand Mary's concerns. And I do think that we have quite a few questions still to be answered. Well, and if there's no additional parties in the public to testify, do we have more? We don't want you to close the record on this. Okay. Quite yet. Um, certainly moving on from accepting public comments at this time. Um, but if we are going to be asking for the applicants to submit anything in addition, we need to hold a record. Well, let's put it this way. We'll just continue the, the public hearing at this point uh, and, and go to some, uh, go to conversation like that. How's that going? Did you get that, Joanna? We're just going to, we're not going to close the public hearing. We're going to continue it, um, you know, at a, at a time to be specified in the future. Okay, it's time for, for us to have some additional comments. Go ahead, Joanna. No, no I, I was just indicating that I heard you. Okay. Sorry, All right. my phone. Okay. No, it's time for our conversation and we can ask questions, you know, of the, of the applicant as well. Um, in terms of what you would like to see, um, you know, <clears throat> in theory, we could go to a decision or we can continue this, you know, this hearing and this conversation uh, to our to our next meeting. Um, it just depends on, on where we wanna go because I think, uh, you know, the applicants have laid out some new information for us tonight in terms of, you know, what they've been thinking about regarding uh, to amend and amending their 
know, the application that we had or the, the layout that we had. So I'll say plenty to discuss. So uh, like Mary, I just I want to get through this, you know, uh, and read some more of it before I say anything definitive, although it sounds like a great idea. Uh, the only thing that I would worry about is the feasibility issue. I mean, we're talking in Skamania Lodge like more or less, right? So I don't know if that's, you know, will that interfere? Probably not. Mm -hmm. Send mine already. <laughs> well, having been through the original uh, review of this of this document um, and looking at the easements and and sort of how we looked at uh, at the public access issue, um, you know, I <clears throat> we we had lengthy comments on public access and it was a fairly extensive layout, but it also didn't look at, in terms of of the feasibility uh, of, of those pathways in some areas. I think uh, one of the points uh, that was made tonight was that ravine crossing there is uh, where it's there. I mean, the easement is there, um, you know, and at some point in time there, you know, there may be uh, an opportunity to put a developed crossing there, but we certainly don't have, we're not connecting to a developed trail system at this point in time. I'd like to see that or easement preserved but you know i'm i'm not one at this point in time to say that we ought to have a bridge to sort of a bridge to nowhere out there at this point so uh you know that's just sort of my initial comment and we also have this trade-off in my mind between um, a habitat conservation area and a trail is going through it um because you know the trail is it can diminish the value of that habitat conservation area but it's also an important public access uh, process as well. Um, I'm more inclined to, I think, to to look at the revised, to look favorably on the revised you know, access layout that they have provided us, uh, in the hopes that in the future we we can cross that ravine. I see little prospect of putting a bridge there and then not having it so steep on the other side. We we don't have good public access. Um, so that may not be feasible now. It may be feasible sometime in the future. I would certainly like to see some of those structures pulled back out of that habitat conservation area to the extent that you can. Uh, and that and that, that be that be protected. Uh, with regard to offsite mitigation, then I think we need to be thinking uh, if in fact that's going to be an element here. That's not something I think we could we could really talk about in any in any detail tonight. Um, but uh, you know, it seems to me that that would be a component of of what we're doing here. I mean, um, we can't do it through enhancement, uh, so it's not going to happen on site. So what do we do offsite, and what's a reasonable thing to do offsite? And I think we we need to have some additional time to uh, to look at what those options are, to, you know, for you to, to you know to talk with the applicant uh, and to see where we might we might come back up uh, in terms of of that process. But that's sort of, I guess, you know, my talk of the head at this point in time. Um, I have to say, I I like the general layout. I think better than the one that was was approved before. Um, I like the way it utilizes the site. I like the fact, I, didn't the earlier proposal actually have sort of a multi-room facility, lodging facility? It, seems it, like was, it, it was nebulous on that because it was yeah. left to a phase two. Yeah, it was the so, phase two. So there were a lot of but just- we were looking at that, yeah. yeah. But I think the, the notion of, you know, the single occupancy structures, I, I like that for that site. I think it's, uh, I think that's good. Uh, I think it fits in well with the nature of the site and uh, and what you're trying to do in terms of providing a, 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 you know, it's that environment there on the waterfront. So that's sort of my summary. Um, ben, do you have any other recommendations you think we should be thinking about? Because 
you laid out your four points. Mm -hmm. I'm sure we've on the on the cultural resources. I'm not so sure you need a full time monitor. No. I just to me, it's such a heavily altered site. And those areas that are still natural are the ones that we're working to stay out of, and there wouldn't be any construction activity. I'm, I'm with Mr. Maldonado. Uh, you know, there hell there was a you know a, a mill on that site for I uh, forget how many years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah, a full time monitor just seems like overkill. So what are the options besides a full time monitor? The draft condition as it's written is to have them prepare a monitoring plan okay. and submit that. When the city um, received a similar comment for our sewer line projects, the um, monitoring plan or mo need for a monitor is limited to when you're going to be digging below disturbed soil. And so there's some back and forth that happens with the State Department of Archaeology and Historic Preservation to establish that as acceptable. and um, then when the contractors were on site, they were noting, uh, yeah, today we'll be getting deep in these areas. They've done in this, in the record here, there's the cultural resources report, then there's also geotechnical studies, so they have an idea of where there's fill on the site and, and where it would be. Um, so it doesn't mean that it's a monitor on site all the time, but it does mean that there's an additional professional preparing that plan um, and being called in uh, when appropriate. <clears throat> The uh, shoreline management program leans toward requiring that and being responsive to those agency requests that we received before. The other aspects of it, I think it is um, appropriate to leave the record open. Uh, for them to provide additional narrative about the avoidance and minimization measures that have gone into this. Um, to present to you, let me take one step back. You all have a luxury. You don't have to be here problem solving for the, the applicant. You sit here saying, does what the applicant brought to you meet your code? Mm -hmm. And so with the, something like an offsite mitigation, um, staff can work with them to present uh, some opportunities or potential mm -hmm. solutions, but uh, responsibility is on them to bring to you. So uh, with offsite mitigation, I think it's appropriate to um, have them present something uh, that's um, uh, their ELS, uh, if they continue on with the project, would, would put together. Um, they, they can consult with me on that. Uh, and then the last thing, Want some more indication from you about, um, again, as staff, as I'm looking at it, it appears hard to justify not connecting uh, in that southern area. But if you all, as planning commission, um, think that there's um, adequate public access here and there's not a, um, a negative impact to existing public access, then that issue can either be left alone or we could start exploring what is feasible alternative access to that. Um, so, you know, we had ideas here that, hey, maybe it is some sidewalk that's tighter to the building up there, maybe, but what is, mm -hmm. how would that project interact with mm -hmm. this or how constructible is this? Um, with subdivisions, land division, um, short plats, what we'll often do is a deferral of frontage improvement agreements where uh, we say that, yes, there is a requirement to do um, public access in this case. Uh, it doesn't make sense to do it right now because the neighboring property isn't ready to do that. You can defer the improvement, agreeing to pay your proportionate share. What's difficult about those is that when we don't have a design, we don't know what the proportionate share is. <laughs> and uh, in this case, the applicant doesn't know if they're going to fund a bridge or if they're going to fund um, sidewalks. And so closing that gap, again, may involve asking them to present some constructible solution uh, to connect to that, that offsite area, but addressing it in some way. Um, or retaining the easement and letting the public address it in some way um, moving into the future. Well, I think we want to retain the easement regardless of how we go with this Definitely. one. Uh, you know, you know it, may, it may prove to be uh, not a feasible route, but I think we want to maintain that, that easement. 
I'm more than willing to look at the, you know at, at how we can better connect what they've laid out, um, you know, on their proposed site plan to what we what we see is is certainly that concept in the easement that we ha already have coming off the Rock Cove side. I think. Mm -hmm. um, so if there are if there's something there that we can address that, I just I want to set. Hopefully, it was when we walk out of here with some pretty clear expectations in terms of what it is uh, that we'd like to see back. I, I don't want this to become you know, the proverbial ping pong uh, activity. Uh, I'd like to be able to see us come back, you know, at a, in another hearing and, and be able to wrap this up so that you know, this project can move ahead. Because I think inherently, uh, it's a pretty strong project. What about uh, event parking? Uh, you know, unless, you know, we're going to use, you know, people are going to park at the interpretive center or something like that. They've got in their narratives here, um, the analysis of parking requirements per the zoning code mm -hmm. indicating that they're meeting. And so if our zone, the question is, is our zoning code appropriate <laughs> for event spaces and event parking? That's something we'll monitor and evaluate and plan for over time. But they, they've indicated that they've met it here. Do you all have a number of people that could be housed at the event part? Just to guess. I thought there was something in that. I never found anything that I read online today. So, could you say that again? Ha, so mm -hmm. if there if there is an event. The occupancy. The occupancy. Uh, with the occupancy of the Our square footage met the parking ratio that you had. Okay. That. I can't I read remember that. if it was yeah. four or five or five, five per thousand or whatever. Correct. And then the other thing that we were going to do, I think that, you know, you had mentioned it, uh, that we were going to talk for the museum and the nights that we, let's say there was everybody capacity full let's say we run into it a couple of times so there's issues uh we would then ask to lease the museum space to be able to shuttle you know people from there we would then monitor our parking shut it off ain't like that parking lot that is ever full yeah. yeah and then we would lease his parking lot for those nights and we would have a shuttle there to shuttle back and forth okay. and the other good thing about a shuttle too is you can take people's car keys you have an event center or in Kennewick. <laughs> And sometimes that's a good thing because you yeah. take people's car keys, you know, and uh, there's no drunk driving and stuff. But uh, we did have the, we did meet the parking ratio of the event center and the cabins. And like I said, any over, we would then move up. Okay. Um, I like the deferral. Currently, we have two or three uh, deferrals in Ridgefield. They also have large paths that go completely around the city. And right now there's two or three places we can't continue those paths on because the other group hasn't uh, developed. So we are right now and we leave the easement and then we agree to participate, you know, to bring to whatever at that time. Uh, it's not a set number or anything, but we do leave the easement, we write a deferral mm -hmm. and it goes on and it passes on with the land. So if I sell or anything, that obligation is there is required. Uh, to the path. So we have all those paths, so, you know, from whole mm -hmm. senior departments to ours and ours. And we just got done. We're having problems with Vancouver Medical Clinic because there's a 20 foot drop. And we did the same thing there. So we went back out to the sidewalk for now to uh, people can walk. And I don't know what we're going to do with the 20 foot drop off down to the creek there. So it's the same thing here. Great. I have a couple points of clarification. Sure. So I think what we'll, what I'm hearing and what we'll come back is we'll come back with a revised narrative speaking to the avoidance and mitigation requirements, as well as a revised site plan showing these areas pushed out of that area for your consideration. Um, uh, a discussion of offsite mitigation will have to work with ELS, and I'll, I'll just ask them to maybe reach out to you on some of the capital improvements that you guys have going on. And then uh, Bruce will have to work up some idea of construct constructible options and maybe cost estimates to help determine like that connection, how that would ever be made if it was built. The biggest problem I have is the offsite mitigation cost. We just went through this in Kennewick. Believe it or not, old growth sagebrush is a protected mm -hmm. species. And we had old growth sagebrush there and we were trying to figure out what the price was, you know, because mm -hmm. we kept it in the critical areas but where it was being developed. 
And so we came up with a number and we, we worked with the um, Department of, not Fish and Wildlife, but Department of Land or something. And they figured how much sagebrush it was an acre. And then we bought an old growth sagebrush patch up on the county there that nobody could bother. It was for natural resources and stuff. Department of Natural Resources is what we did. But we went back and forth trying to figure out what the price of, you know, sagebrush is. It's not a common market commodity sold every day. But my concern there is what is the enhancement cost? Our, you know, our what? impacts are going to be less because we're moving out of it. Mm -hmm. So yeah. then it'll just be a, 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 a metric of, okay, so how much are you impacting? How much does it cost to mitigate? I think right now we're at five to one, which is above. So we would need to, I mean, that's why ELS needs to be involved and they would work yeah. up a cost. So then ELS would be and that's our, what we would present to the city. Would be our controlling factor there. Yeah. Okay. I just didn't want to look at Ben and go, oh, I don't know what's the price. We, <laughs> and yeah. that, you know? <laughs> that's my favorite horse. Yeah, it's been a good family member, you know. So there's got to be a numbers. Okay, great. I feel better about that. And I just wanted to, another clarification was the question about the platting. So actually what we're doing is we're just consolidating lots to make it a cleaner parcel. So there's not going to be tax, lot, tax lots hanging out out there. Sure. It's just going to be all a single lot. And plat vacations are uh, the purview of the city council. Mm -hmm. And so with the changes, um, likely changes to the easements on this, it's the cleanest way to wipe that clean. Um, the decision making process here would be you all are setting public access expectations. And then when it goes to city council, it's a very easy discussion to say the planning commission has required this and it's a reduction of lots and black and forward. But instead of um, it'll help them make a decision. And we just we haven't done the um, consolidation of decision making into one body, the highest body here. So uh, it's still a two-step process, but waiting on that. My goal uh, here is to be able to get back into the dirt uh, portion of this before the end of the year. I don't know if that's possible. I'd like to finish getting PUD laid out. I'd like to get our runs from our main water and sewer and everything and get so when we spring comes around, we're ready to roll. Uh, just to give you an idea of my expectations to you know, do some stuff during the winter. I can battle that in the rain, but I can't battle, you know, I don't, I can't, but I'm not too old to battle building in the rain. So, you know, hopefully we have an early spring, late spring, but we'll get started, you know. Yeah. So that's our goal is to get all the groundwork and stuff done. In the wintertime. So I think we probably laid out, I think, the most significant questions we want to address. But I would like to hope that if the planning commission members read through these documents over the next week, that Ben, they may be able to, if there's any other questions that come up, that we don't hold them till another hearing, that mm -hmm. we, can, we can provide those questions. That was my next question. Are we looking 10 days, 15 days, 20 days? What, what, what would, is there a set amount that you guys? There is not. You guys okay. are free to set um, hold over the hearing until any date that you would specify here. Um, your next meeting is the uh, second Monday of November. And so that is a natural one. Uh, I'm sure that Dean can get responses from his um, professionals and, and we report sooner than that. Um, well, y'all have been working on this since pre COVID, you know? So. <laughs> Let's not bring up how bad I am at this today, this project. Okay. So November 13th, so when would it go to city council? Uh November 13th. You you all make the decision on shoreline permits. Mm -hmm. And so that would um have things rolling and they could be digging in parallel with the um city council review. Okay. Um city council review would need to happen before they could put structures next to those lot lines. Yeah. But okay. it, it's not a critical path for, for for many of the things that they'll be working on. So what do you think we could have answers to these questions by? Well, I touch base with ELS, but probably a week 
Okay. So even if we give it, it's the ninth, let's go the 16th and the 23rd, the latest we could you know, come back was the week of the 23rd. Are you feel comfortable with that? The 25th? I'm comfortable if they're comfortable. Mm -hmm. So we'll try and get you answers by the 25th. So you have time to look at it before your next meeting. And uh, if that'll work for you guys, and that's kind of part mm -hmm. of what's And during that period, we, anything else in the public that comes up, we're more than willing to address. Okay. Um, the, am I hearing then that holding it open until the next regular meeting? Yes. Okay. I think we actually know at this point. Procedurally, um, you all are still, the record is still open. Um, you're still subject to the appearance of fairness uh, doctrine. So we'll go through the disclosures process again the next time. Um, the best practice is if somebody comes to approach you to say, thank you. If you have questions, <laughs> go talk to city staff or provide written comments for the record, um, but not to discuss it. Um, any details there. Uh, I am happy to talk with anybody about this and, and lay things out. Um, but uh, recessing then the public hearing until six o'clock on uh, Monday, November 13th. Sounds good. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for your Thank you. work and your ability to work with us. We look forward to getting it up and running and getting it to be an asset. Working in the community. So we are now on the subcommittee reports. Thank you. And parking committee can go first. <laughs> parking committee is going to be Ben because we really haven't discussed much in the last time. Parking committee um, is exciting. So I um, started to crunch uh, some of the numbers on this, and I'm, I'm forgetting to share the screen. Let me do that uh, again. Okay. Sharing screen. So I'll start with um, just comparisons for our usage study uh, between this time and the last time around. So again, we did the usage study the last full weekend of the summer before school started. Uh, so that was uh, Thursday, the 24th of this year, and then um, Saturday, the 26th of this year. Uh, and comparing it to the weekend a couple weekends later when we did it in 2021, uh, we have numbers uh, now. Parking, I'll remind you, and I'll remind you several times as we go through this, the magic number is 85%. 85% is the, the break-even point where, uh, as a user, you feel like there is a spot for you to park when you go uh, drive along a block or in a, um, a parking lot and um, the point where you don't. And so when you're making investments in parking, you want to be as close as possible to that uh, to get the right return on investment. If you have more parking than that, um, you're over-invested. We're largely over-invested, um, at least uh, based on these dates. So uh, there's a slight uptick uh, compared to 2021. Uh, again, these are just points in time, so we don't no, uh, but I will present some a map uh, showing this later on. Uh, we're not above 60%. So most of it is uh, overbuilt at this time or ready for future development and future users. Uh, or kind of really approaching that sweet spot of, hey, it's not, it's not too much, it's not too little. Um, uh, 2021, well, if you look at the uh, dotted line, uh, at the very bottom of these, uh, we got better with our volunteers and collecting data over time. Um, so those graphs at the bottom are the 2021 graphs. There's missing data. Uh, in one case, it's more, more parking spaces weren't counted than cars were counted. Uh, on the Saturday, it was a very rainy Saturday there. I think we lost a, a data sheet. Um, but that's 
that's what we have and that's what we have to deal with um very low um this time by that saturday things were really clicking just a couple of blocks uh, weren't counted um the thursday morning um weren't quite click clicking yet and we lost some some data there but um our busiest hours uh, on these days and reflected in 2023 are that early afternoon, one till four o'clock, and they start uh, failing off. Um, that's true on Thursdays, on Saturdays. The, the peaks were a little earlier. Things changed a little and we down core. Um, uh, the core and out there generally that's um, the course, uh, Russell Street, uh, upper end of Russell Street, upper Russell Street, on Street from the hardest store to the first store and first meets. Um, we counted all the vehicles in the parking lots at Screen Courthouse and at AMJ, and then in all of the parking lots that were off the actual uh, between first and second. The total end is the total of the groups like that option. And then the commission and something that was on street and all those on the side to bring the vehicle to the parking lot at the AJ employee only. Not counting the employee in the parking lot. Yeah. Um, it's hard to say anybody else. Yeah. Um, so some data. Uh, the perception, of course, that we're working against is that a lot of users feel that there is a parking problem. There's not enough parking spaces. So that's. Um... Okay, stop. Is there any attribute that to them in terms of business map? It's proxy to where they want to go. It's somewhat proxy to where they want to go. It's also just usage over time. This is in for 2023. Any block face or parking lot that um, was over 85% is in red here. The orange hill is kind of that sweet spot where not uh, immediate need to invest in new spaces and, and not overbuilt. Um, but anybody who's driven past down this street uh, in August of 2023, or those days, at, at certain hours would have said there's a parking problem there there's a parking problem there there's a parking problem in, in these lots <laughs> and you know those perceptions are true for the people mm -hmm. and so there there are areas where parking is constrained over the course of the day there's no there's really there's no there are some specific blocks and so the next um, task of the committee will be to suss out um, the improvement projects that we've already identified at the staff level and say okay add some parking here and we'll see if we can get that some that red down to the next time things into the orange uh there's some other well is it add parking or add um timed parking and all of the other right right because yeah. on russell street that was an issue yeah so those some of those considerations are what we go through it's can we find uh ways to add more parking spaces can we add meters Can we add timing and then monitoring of that mm -hmm. can we just talk to some of those business owners to say look our busy time is in the summer when it's nice weather our busy time is during the day when um, things are safe, do you think we could just park um, a couple blocks over on First Street? Of course, those employees park all along Russell on the east side, and that and they could certainly park uh, near the courthouse annex and not park there. And that would leave that entire parking from the bottom to the top empty. They're, they're all employees that park there. So get some employee parking off site or away from the main street. Yeah, but it's it's great to have this data. It's great to start um, really mm -hmm. exploring what those solutions might be. Um, additional, um, I, I jump straight to the peak of it, but we have a map for every day how things go. Throughout the course of our data collection there. Um, over time and, and where the peak is and where they're going. Um, so, man, things are easy. Yeah, well, I've noticed that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so this verifies that we start getting into noon one o'clock. There's a red that's in there. Um, when, you, when you start looking at the um, rates, there's workers that are parking or residents that are leaving for the day on the Ash Alley. Uh, the courthouse, AMJ, of course, customer um, parking. I'm surprised in there on Kanaka Street that you have the red zones there. I that think. was crazy um, use of the river. It was windy days. Uh, windy days. Yeah. Weekends or it, both. Uh, both? Both of them so were packed. Fish run. So the morning. started fishing in the morning and then it was all in the transition. So in sports and Yeah. So. I have to say that's really cool to be able to sit here and look at it for an hour. Yeah, it is. That is pretty yeah. cool. And we'll have that for all of them. Um, but that's this is the the biggest key then for um one, developing the master parking plan that says let's add these two spaces over here. 
Um, let's uh, consider a bigger addition in this side and, and put a cost to those. Uh, at that point, as a planning commission, you guys can start looking at the regulatory changes for um, whether it's justified to reduce uh, the parking burden for new development uh, or whether to spread the cost of adding spaces off uh, as potential for um, uh, payment in lieu of on-site parking. So uh, it's great seeing these come together. Mm -hmm. It is nice, nice work. Oh, we had great volunteers. Mm -hmm. cool. yeah. yeah, the partnership with the Downtown Association on this was, that was great. Yep. Good. Well, the annexation committee, you know, we talked about some of that at the last meeting, about how, we were, how we were looking at those areas, you know, just outside the existing city limits. And that our approach was not to look at areas that we wanted to annex, but to set that policy up for folks that were interested uh, in annexing and talking about how would you how would you make that work for the city efficiently through the extension of city services and that kind of roads, et cetera. And in the course of that conversation, we we also started looking and saying, well, we've got large areas within the city that don't have some of those basic city services, sewer in particular. And of course, that became a, a topic here for the city council uh, here um, just, what was it? two weeks ago, I guess now. Uh, and uh, and I think that is it's going to be an integral part of whatever we come up with for an annexation policy because you want that annexation policy not to set some standard that is in conflict uh, or overrides what you're trying to do within the city in terms of extending services. So uh, I think at this point we're we're looking at, at how you come together with an overall sort of city services sort of strategy in terms of how would you handle the extension of, of sewer and water, both within the within the existing unserved areas, and how does that then affect those areas where you would want to extend it outside the existing city uh, limits in terms of an annexation. <clears throat> And I think we're still also trying to come to grips with how do you how do you how do you still find these areas where when you annex them we started talking about the efficiency in terms of, of annexation. In other words, if you annex an area that's all five and ten acre par parcels, and they're not going to convert, it, providing services to the on, to that dispersed development is very costly. How how can we identify areas where you might expect a more urban density in terms of, of construction that makes sense to extend city services, um, you know, whether it's sewer or water or transportation or any other city services? So we're we're trying to look at those areas as well and where those opportunities are. Um, because a fair amount of the area just outside of the of the city limits is fairly well developed in in, yeah. in low density, okay? Mm -hmm. Because they're all on on septic systems, so they're well at least two acres. Um, but there are a lot of other larger size acres, and you know, how practical is it to expect that those could be redeveloped at a at a higher density? You know, mm -hmm. there are some real questions there for us in terms of saying. What are those areas that are really good candidates for annexation? Well, it's easy to like a you know fans neighborhood or that neighborhood at the uh, at the town, you know. Jimmy Dixon. Yeah, but those little single lots like uh, the ones you were talking we were talking about uh, up off of uh, Loop Road. Uh, yeah, it's very low density. Yeah. yeah. What the committees tentatively decided and what they haven't tentatively decided on. Um, first thing is that 
the annexation policy shouldn't be um, shouldn't endeavor to annex land. It should stand as a policy that people who are considering annexing to the city can read, can process how the city's going to uh, respond to them when they come forward to uh, request annexation. It's not going to pursue annexation right. um, that is unwanted by the people there. Um, the that decision then bleeds into the next decision about establishing the outer out, out boundary of an annexation area. Uh, that's one of the three or four key, well, only decisions that the city really needs to make when considering an annexation. And so limiting that um, those areas to the people who are requesting or the people who are adjacent to uh, what's requesting and already are developed at the um, surrounding density. Mm -hmm. um, Would your boundary review board uh, do some of that? Mm -hmm. The city that makes decisions sends that decision to the boundary review board. The boundary review board can make or remake some of those mm -hmm. uh, decisions, but need to to get to one uh, first. But I think having a having a good rationale in terms of how you're going to deal with annexations. So those folks that are pursuing an annexation, as well as the city, those expectations are out there. You know, you know what to expect, and I think. Once you have that, I think it, that even serves the boundary review board when it takes a look at this. Mm -hmm. So you, you, you've you gone through this process, you've laid out what, what it is you're trying to achieve and and what the expectations are of all the parties. Mm -hmm. our, our attorney at the conference this last few days, mm -hmm. um, Robert Kaufman talked about interlocal agreements for annexation. Are you all uh, looking at that? In what... <laughs> In what I, I don't understand it. Don't ask me. Yeah. But it is a new thing for annexations. Uh, we just had our conference in Puyallup mm -hmm. on the 4th through 6th. And uh, that was one of the things he brought up. I, I don't understand. Some of the older members understand it perfectly. And mm -hmm. I'm sure we could get an explanation. But it, it's a it's different not. Form. The, the form falls more into that. Hey, we're going to annex this. Yeah, he's, he's given a very good uh, presentation. He gave us like a two-hour presentation mm -hmm. on uh, Thursday, and there will be an audio available on mm -hmm. his talk and uh, on, on how BRBs make their decisions with the objectives and uh, factors that we have to consider when we do this. So um, I'll, I can send it uh, to you all, and you can listen to him. He's uh, He is the King County's... Uh, a, a special console for BRBs. Hmm. Yeah, and I, we still have to touch base ultimately with the county too, in, in yeah. terms of what we're thinking and, and 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 how does this dovetail with the decisions that the county's making and the county planning commission is making? Um, because right now, uh, at least to my knowledge, those decisions aren't really all that coordinated between the two jurisdictions. You know, they're making their land use to sit decisions out there without really thinking about how that might ultimately affect the city. But, you know, the same is probably true of us as well in terms of the land use decisions we make. I'm still so. mad at them for what they did in my backyard. For the logging operation. So. Um we've identified some zoning but i think like uh jeff said really the the process of exploring how to provide logically provide services outside city limits stops because we haven't the city hasn't come to grips with how to logically provide services within city limits to get to the point where annexation can can be a better oiled um machine so um continue to move forward and I do I hope to get something uh, in front of you all, even if it's something that we may expect to change after um, more is known. Well, I think we can start to start to rough out a frame, a policy framework. You know, it may not have all the detail that we ultimately want to have, but I think it can set that direction. And we can start to, we can start to fill in those details, I think, as we have a conversation in terms of what we'd like to see. But, 
give us an interim project. And Ben's already been working on that. Ben's working on everything. <laughs> <laughs> So what's our thought for the month, Ben? Uh, community submission um, that I believe the link may be broken on, but it's the Walla Walla uh, design standards. Um, so this came from the downtown association uh, saying that they're doing it over there and uh, it may be an investment, but those investments pay dividends um, I looked at it. over the you years. So. Yeah, it came up. So. Um, just too much others are doing it. Uh, it is something that's identified as um, possible through our downtown plan and city council um, uh, previous direction. So uh, that's presented for you uh, with no agenda, just to present. <laughs> there was something that I had just read too that I thought might be of interest in my name. But there's a lot going on out there. I, I think it's been it's been pretty interesting here lately. Shoreline Public Access Plan was approved by the City Council. Sweet. Yep. Yeah. Um, so that's good. We next steps on that are I will uh, clean up other recommendations to amend the SMP uh, to present to you all to, to try to process through that and. Um, it'll be a truncated but similar process to the comprehensive amendment to do to do amendments so comprehensive update to do amendments um, that's a lot of involvement with Department of Ecology um, has not begun but I think the shoreline access plan and that's really a nice piece of work I think it really came through well mm -hmm. um, I mean it really is one of the key assets that we have as a community. Yep. And uh, I think it, it, it was a good bit of work. I was very impressed. So. The septic and sewer discussion, um, like Jeff said, there was a, a workshop at the city council meeting last month. Uh, the city council has formed a subcommittee to talk about uh, those issues really in relation to rates uh, ultimately that's what's driving this and and that didn't come through so the uh, subcommittee on that uh, will be a broad cross-section of the community sewer users people on septic vacant landowners um, different types of sewer users industrial commercial um, residential uh, coming together to better understand the issue and see if that um, uh sewer connection requirements should be changed uh or changed in a different way than has been proposed yeah i mean what kind of an incentive can we provide to you know for those types of extensions i think i think if you look at the policies it stands now that really hasn't been implemented you know i think most people would you know well i think that's what people were responding to in in, in some ways um is that if we were really really going with the, with what the policy is currently folks wouldn't be happy but how do you how do you come up with a logical approach to extend those services to support the densities that we want and further some of the other objectives we have you know we talk about affordable housing well if you can't start putting services out there you can't have the density that's going to allow you to have affordable housing mm -hmm. And so it it ties back to a lot of the a lot of the basic goals that we have as a city. So it's an, going to be an important discussion. I think you all need to have a discussion about affordable housing and what it actually means, and if you can ever achieve it. Because as we heard from Oregon, they they had meetings what last week it was reported on the news, and uh, with their government officials, mm -hmm. like in Salem and that. And uh, the question that one member of the public asked was, well, okay, you're building all this affordable housing, but people with lots of money are buying it. So it's no <laughs> longer affordable. So how are you gonna keep it affordable? And the answer was they didn't know. Well, there was the article that what was in the Seattle Times about uh, the binge and white salmon area where you know they're having a hard time, mm -hmm. you know, finding workers you know, for a lot of the local businesses because those folks can't find any place to live that's affordable. So it's, 
you know, it is an issue. And but it's such a it's a it's a very all encompassing issue. I mean, it's there's no one silver bullet to it because I think even when we went back and look at all the area that we have zoned for higher density or multifamily, it's out there, but those lands aren't being utilized for that. And so you have to ask the question as to well, why? You know, what's what's preventing that type of development from, from happening? I looked at white salmon, but uh, yeah, when I worked there, and man, it is expensive. I thought of you, Mary, and I should have sent it to you. Um, there's a really good article on downtown Vancouver on the waterfront mm -hmm. and the agreements they're making. I don't know if you read it, but they're making with the developers. I think they're doing some kind of whatever the taxes. I don't remember what it was, um, but basically it's really interesting the way they decided to try to do affordable housing. But then they talked about the pricing of just rental units, mm -hmm. affordable <laughs> housing. Well, you guys have not heard from Hector Yamahosa, but he has been at the Democrats and he came to help his Samania and um, I'm not sure there's some other group. He, he talked about the units that he's building in the Rose Village. There's two developments in Vancouver, mm -hmm. Himahosa. And uh, the, it's collaborative roots, 501c3, mm -hmm. and uh, $650 a month. That's affordable. But it is, and, and it, it has, it's based on your salary. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm not sure if they have a 30 or 50 year covenant for that. I think it should be 500 years, but that's just me. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, he's building homes for in, tiny homes for individuals and small homes for families. And uh, they are all solar powered. They have full appliances in there, a shower, and their bill for 2021 electric bill was $321 because and they were actually selling electricity. It's doable, but you have to do the, have the policies in place mm -hmm. to achieve it. It's not gonna be, oh, let's all just build affordable housing. We had the Department of Commerce guy come to up to the BRB mm -hmm. here this week. And, and he was, oh yeah, it's gonna trickle down. Well, that's, that's mm -hmm. worked. Mm -hmm. uh, every time you build affordable housing, unless you have a covenant in place that says it's affordable housing and only people at certain salaries can, can be in there, it doesn't stay affordable. Y'all would faint if I told you how much I rent I pay. Pardon? Y'all would faint if I told you how much rent I pay. Mm. Faint in a good way, hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's going to have to change, but it's going to have to be by policy, not by good intentions. Indeed. Any other business to come before tonight? Um, parks planning is underway. We don't have a subcommittee from the Planning Commission at that. The city's leading a coalition on behalf of the county, the port, the school, the pool, and the city to develop a parks plan that will make any of our projects eligible for state grant funding within the Stevenson urban area. Um, we have uh, done our soft transition to online building permitting, so applicants from Anywhere in the world, we'll be able to submit uh, all their information. We'll do uh, paperless transactions with uh, all of that. Tiffany is um, our lead on uh, getting that going. Uh, and uh, the soft transition means that we're entering it in online, still taking the paper based applications, but uh, aim to transition by the uh, first of the year to having applicants submit their own. Uh, it allows us to do concurrent reviews um, between departments. So the planning department, public works, and building departments are all looking at it at the same time instead mm -hmm. of one file moving from a desk to another desk to another desk and adding time for applications. So um, that's uh, that promises to deliver project uh, permits and decisions much more quickly. It also promises to increase the coordination we do between the departments because in real time we can see uh, what everyone else has done and review that before the um, final sign off uh, goes for the permit. So if I request a change, then Public Works knows about that. <laughs> of, uh, they've already signed off on it. So um, two main major benefits uh, should come out of that. And, uh, 
look forward to those benefits. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you have to do a power plant for me, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I know it'll make it split. Right, right through, right, man? Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, and Hanford might call you some beer. I put too much time there. Yeah. <laughs> I don't need to go back. <laughs> Have we ever had an update on the cleanup at Bonneville? That lady that came to speak with us? Yeah. yeah. Okay, well, if there's no further business until November. Until then. Just prior to turkey time. Well, if we have questions for Ben. Yes, yeah. You go through this stuff. You got some additional questions for Ben within a week because I think they're, they want to move pretty quickly in terms of getting back to this. I don't blame them weather wise, you know. Really? There's little scooters that out there. It was Lonnie's. So he was riding all the way home on that in the dark. It's a cute little thing. Oh, that was good. That was good. Yeah. Is. I witnessed him um, cleaning up the little park where the sculpture is on Rock Cove. He had his rake out there. I've seen him out there. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. 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 All right, kids. Ready. Where's August tonight? Mm -hmm. Wasn't here last month. Okay. Well, we are like our nice weather is gone. We, are, are we adjourned? We are adjourned. Thank you. Thank uh, you all very much. Well, we're, we could get two inches of rain in the next two and a half days. <laughs> yeah, it seems like it goes from really, really, really nice, nice to yeah. really, really nasty. <laughs> <laughs> well, we Oh, El Nino is going to be a super El Nino. Well, and then the wind on top of that means. Mm -hmm.